In the construction industry, being able to read a set of plans is by far one of the most valuable tools you can have. I've been in this industry for 13 years and I've worked with dozens of carpenters that still cannot take a set of plans and frame a home. My goal with this is to give you guys the information that you could take to the job site to implement and ideally better yourself as a carpenter. This is a multi-part series, so there's a link in the pinned comment down below that'll take you to the playlist to watch all these videos. With that said, let's get into it. We're back at the plan table here, and today we're gonna talk about something a little different. Today we're talking about the structural page. We are on S2. This is gonna show us the majority of the material getting used to build this house. Now, as with anything, the second we start, we're gonna read through everything on the outside everything at the top, anything that we've got here on the page. That way we know as much information as possible before we start diving into any of this. While this is important, a lot of what's referenced here is called out on the outside. So let's get into that first. Up here at the top, we've got moisture content verification note. That is not gonna be something that we do. That'll be general contractor, builder, project manager, whoever takes care of that. But that is not on the framing contractor. Edge nailing note, provide roof ply edge nailing along all rafters or trusses in line. That's pretty typical. They just want perimeter nailing around the thing. Dimension control note, architectural floor plan controls all building dimensions. In the architectural lesson we did, I talked to you guys a little bit about this, that the architect is gonna make the decision on any of the numbers in the building plan. The structural engineer is just gonna tell you how to get from here to here with a beam. And that's exactly what's being said here is do not go off of the structural for numbers, go off of the structural for the material itself. Contractor to reference architectural floor plan for all dimensions associated with the project foundation and framing unless otherwise specified on the structural plans and details. Basically, don't pull numbers off of this. We've got waterproofing and ventilation note. These structural plans provide the necessary structural specs and details for the project only and are not intended to include details or specs for flashing, waterproofing, ventilation, or drainage. You guys saw in the architectural floor plan that they kind of touched on the drainage and the ventilation a bit, along with a couple of the flashing details as well. The structural engineer is just saying that they are not responsible for that. Roof framing note, number one, use H1 clips at each truss slash rafter to top plate connection. Number two, solid block between each truss slash rafter. Provide vented eave blocks at every third truss. If applies, bounce off of this for a second. You guys have seen us install one vented block, two solids, one vented block, two solids. That's for a vented roof system. And that's what they're calling for on that note there. Number four, all roof sheathing to be polar plier equal radiant sheathing. That's the sheathing with a silver, like a shiny backing to it that's supposed to prevent heat from getting transferred down into the attic. And as crazy as it sounds, it might not work. I've been in attics that have it and I've been in attics that don't and the difference is insane. The radiant sheathing seems to work really well. Number five, provide flashing and counter flashings at roof to wall connections to divert runoff. Number six, provide approved waterproofing over all flat areas. Seven, see architectural plans for all flashing details. And eight, all exposed eaves to have exterior rated ply. Onto the framing note down here, unless otherwise noted, all headers above openings at exterior, bearing, and shear walls shall be a minimum of four by six if we have two by four walls and six by eight if we have two by six walls. Number two, unless otherwise noted, all headers above openings at non-bearing walls shall be a minimum of four by four at two by four walls and six by six at two by six walls. These two details right here are key though because say you have this interior wall that doesn't get a call out, we don't have a header called out, you can reference this right here. You know that we have a four by six at two by four walls if it's load bearing. That's exactly what that is there. But come over to say something like this where it's interior non-load bearing and we go back to that detail and you can see here, all headers above openings at non-bearing walls shall be a minimum of four by four. So load bearing here, we're gonna use a four by six. Non-load bearing here, we're gonna use a four by four. All top plates to have minimum 48 inch lap at splices with 14, 16 Ds staggered per connection unless otherwise noted. Frame exterior, bearing and shear walls with two by six dug for number two studs at 16 on center. That's pretty common. Provide eighth inch gap between all adjacent shear wall plywood edges. This one's key. Most people don't do this. Most people slam their sheets tight and think that there's nothing that's gonna happen. But as moisture gets into those sheets and as heat and cold and everything affects the building, all the elements outside, they'll expand and contract. You'll end up with buckling and the sheets will pop out a bit. And the last note that we've got here is truss framing note. Number one, truss manufacturer to provide all truss to truss connections, hardware specs, and hardware connectors. Number two, truss members and components shall not be cut, notched, drilled, or otherwise altered in any way without written concurrence and approval of a registered design professional. This right here says do not cut your trusses. If you build a good relationship with your truss manufacturer, you can get an in the field fix where they'll quickly come up with an idea to correct an issue. Say something runs too long or too short, they'll give you a fix but you do not do anything without their approval. 
Number three, contractor and project framer to confirm all truss span dimensions, truss profiles, heel depths, and roof pitch of truss prior to ordering and confirming fabrication with truss company. Now let's talk about that. What they just called for on that number three truss framing note is a field measure. What I mean by that is when you go to build this house and you have the whole entire thing plated out, or sometimes they won't do it unless you have all walls up, they will come out and do a field measure. And what they're doing is measuring from this side of the building all the way over to here. And this side of the building all the way to here to get their count. They'll come out here and make sure that from here to here you have the correct number and all the way down the side of the building. Their goal with this is to make sure that the trusses match the building itself. I've built a lot of houses where the concrete contractor comes in and mistakenly shortens the building six inches. If the trusses just got built to match that, by the time they got put up we'd realize, oh we're six inches too long. So they come out and say the building does get shortened, they pull a number from here all the way over to here and adjust everything accordingly. If you have any changes that need to be made, that's when they get made. Today's video is sponsored by House Pro, an all-in-one construction management software that allows you to run your business a bit better. Imagine having a staff built out of seven to 10 people to answer your emails, to reply to people, to build out different color boards and stuff that allow you to show your client exactly what they're gonna get. Imagine being able to build out 3D floor plans and show in person exactly what the client's project is gonna look like. You can have all of that and more with House Pro. Client communication, subcontractor relations, all of your information stored in one spot. The best part about all of it, it's accessible right from your phone. So if you guys want fast and easy takeoffs, you wanna be able to access any bit of your project no matter where you're at, House Pro is a perfect option for you. One of the most common questions I get asked is, is my company big enough to utilize a software like this. My favorite thing about this is even though you're a small company, it has all the resources necessary, estimating proposals, takeoffs, contracts, and more for you to seem like you're a bigger company. It's gonna help you out a ton. So click the link down in the description down below and thank you House Pro for sponsoring today's video. Back up to reading everything on the page, we have framing callouts, the light gray, is gonna represent valley fill at frame over per detail 6D1. We'll get into that in just a bit and show you how to look at those details and reference them. The dash lines here, solid block roof diaphragm with two by flat blocking at all panel edges and 10D nails at six and 12 spacing. We'll show you guys where that is. It's all along the outside of the building in a couple other spots. And then you remember on the architectural floor plan how they had a lot of these referenced, little squares with a number in them and they went all the way around the plans. But on the architectural side, it was more so, this is an appliance, this is an appliance, this is a gas line. On the structural side of things, you can see the first one right off the bat. We've got one all the way across here and that is provide two CS16 by 48 straps at beam to beam slash truss and line connection. What they're calling for there is a connection from the beam to the beam. We have six by eight, six by eight, six by eight. They want to see us 16 going across each one of those breaks. Number two, beam continuous over column to provide framing continuity to corner. Number three, sheath end wall with shear panel. Number one schedule right up here, we'll get into that. For tie back rigidity at porch to roof plane connection. Number four, LUS24 at truss to truss slash ledger connection. Anytime you don't know what something is. So you don't know what an LUS24 is. Your best tool to figure any of that out is your cell phone. Pull it out, go to Google, search Simpson Strong Tie LUS24. You can find out what that looks like in about 30 seconds. Number five, attach king post to trimmer with SDS six inch screws at eight inch on center. Number six, two by ledger at top and bottom cord of front porch trusses per detail 16D1. Now we're on to my favorite section here, which is the shear wall schedule, which is typically where most people learn how to read plans. This is gonna be key for you guys. Inside of the triangles here, we have one through five. And then you can see sheathing, studs at panel edges, nailing, edge nailing, field nailing, sill plate, top plate connector, sill plate connection at subfloor, and anchor bolts at foundation. This is gonna take us a little bit to get through, but let's go through it. To start us off, what they're gonna do anytime they label a shear wall is put one of these numbers next to it. That is the shear wall schedule itself. Let's start off with number one here. This is our easiest shear wall that we've got, 1530 seconds plywood. You could use OSB as a replacement, and it says one side down there at the bottom. Studs at panel edges, double two by minimum. So at each panel break, every four feet, they want a double stud. Nailing, 8D at six and 12. You guys have seen us lay out nail patterns quite often. Six and 12 is the most common, and if you don't have a call out, six and 12 is what you do. So that is very typical. Sill plate right there, our bottom plate is two by material. Top plate connectors, they give us two options. One we use, one we never use. The first is A35 to 18 inch on center. That would be from the top plate to the truss itself. That's what we would typically use or 16D at six inch on center. And you can see this little symbol. That little symbol right here provides 16D nails for pressure blocking connections to bottom cord of truss or top plate. We would never do that detail. It's not typical for us and there's not a lot of structural engineers that'll let that fly. These last two here, you're gonna use one or the other depending on if you're building on a slab on grade 
or if you're building on a subfloor. If you're building on a subfloor, the connection is an SDS four and a half inch long at 12 inch on center down through the sill plate into the subfloor. Anchor bolts at foundation, if you were on a slab on grade, you'd have 5 8 diameter at 48 inch on center. That would be your anchor bolts going all the way through. Now, as we go down, you guys can see this for yourselves. Let's just go to number five, for instance. Number five, we have this little symbol here. Studs shall be minimum three by. At panel edges, use three by pressure treated dug for bottom plate. Stagger nails at double top plate and panel edges. This is our heaviest shear wall that we've got here. 1930 seconds plywood, so 5 eighths they're calling for three by at panel edges. So every three feet on your panel edges, you're gonna have a three by six. Nailing is 10 Ds, so a little bit thicker of a nail. That's that 148 at two and 12. So around the panel edge, you're gonna have nails every two inches, as opposed to the six that we started with on the number one wall. But this is where I've made a lot of mistakes. This sill plate here, three, four, and five, you have to have three by plate. So instead of having a two by six bottom plate, you're gonna have a three by six bottom plate. Now there's more to this. On number five, our A35 connection is now six inch on center from 18 that we had up here. This number five wall is really pulling some weight. SDS, six inch screws at four inch on center as opposed to the 12 that we started with. And the five eighths anchor bolts are now 10 inch on center. Now you're not gonna have a whole house littered with number five walls. It's gonna be one or two walls if that. We'll check in just a second to see if that wall even applies to this building. Engineers will have this shear wall schedule built out already and pasted onto this set of plans and sometimes we don't use five, four, or three, we'll use one and two. Let's read through our notes real quick before we jump into plan reading. Number one, all walls to be fully blocked. Two, all nails specified are common where air gun nails are used. Care shall be taken to use true common nail equivalents. Number three, refer to vertical diaphragm notes for material and application specifications. Four, for walls which bear trusses, one H1 clip from truss to top plate may be used in place of one A35 top plate connector. So that's giving you the option to swap out an A35 for an H1. Five, provide Simpson BP5 bearing plate at all 5 8 anchor bolts or BPS5, which is a slotted washer to allow for slotted conditions. Like I said, anytime you have a hardware piece that you don't know what it is, Google it and it'll pop up pretty quick. Six, use LTP4s, that is the plate connection, or RBC at three by sill to rim joist or solid blocking. Use spacing as per A35 on your top plate connector. So they're telling you here from the three by sill plate to the rim joist, you need to use an LTP4 and you need to use the spacing as per A35 on your top plate connector right up here, whatever the shear wall may be. So if we're on a number five wall and we're connecting down to that subfloor, we need to have LTP4s at six inch on center. Number seven is okay to use RBC in lieu of A35 at truss slash rafter blocking to top plate connections. We're not gonna do that, we're just gonna use A35s. And this last one here doesn't have anything to do with this. Eight, structural design for wood structural panels based on DOC, PS1, and PS2. Basically talking about the panels. So when you look at a set of plans like this, it can be kind of intimidating because there's so many different things going on. So many different lines running across here. You've got different arrows pointing different ways. All these call outs throughout here and it can get hectic. We're gonna take this and break it down one by one and explain the basics to you guys so that you have a better understanding of how to frame based off structural plans. The architectural floor plan we use a lot for layout all the way down the side. The structural set is how we actually figure out what we're doing. So let's zoom on in here and figure out what is going on here. So to kick us off here, I wanna talk about some shear walls and how to locate those. You can see that we've got this little dashed line from here over to here. And that dashed line runs all the way through with a three and then five foot three above it. That's referencing a number three shear wall where we have 15 30 seconds ply. We have three by minimum at our panel edges, eight Ds at three and 12. So this section here, we would label at three and 12. The sill plate, the bottom plate itself needs to be three by, and the overall wall is five foot three as noted right there. As we come over to this section here, we've got that same number three wall called out. So that's gonna be three and 12 nailing as well. And that wall runs from right here over to the corner out there. This here says perforated shear wall and it's 15 foot six long from here to here. Now, what is a perforated shear wall? A shear wall itself is where we have plywood going from this side to this side, nailed all the way through at a certain pattern that they give us on the structural page. A perforation is a hole. So we have two holes in this shear wall. That's why it's called a perforated shear wall. Oftentimes what they'll have us do here is run blocking out from the header to both sides and the sill to both sides. And we install that CS16 strapping going all the way across. You can see that done here in the example. So that's how we're gonna figure out our shear walls. They'll be noted with these dashed lines running alongside the wall. We'll have a number and a triangle. It'll tell us the overall length from one side to the other. They're gonna start and stop on a structural member. So we have a four by here, we have a four by here. You can see that noted. 
And shear walls are gonna be all over the place, so you have to make sure that when you're building this place, from here to here will be a typical two by six bottom plate, but from here to here and from here to here, we're gonna have that three by sill plate call out. So it's gonna be three by sill plate, back to two by sill plate, up to three by sill plate, back to two by sill plate. That's what's difficult about building here in California is you have call outs like this that make you change the bottom plate, which also changes your stud height. Let's just say this was a nine foot wall through here. So we had 104 and a quarter studs. That's our typical wall stud on a nine foot wall. You have two by plate here, here, and then three by here and here. You'd have to take an inch off of the studs from there to there and another inch off the studs all the way through here to make the top plate match up all the way through. So that's how you figure out what your shear walls are. We'll give you a couple more examples as we go through this video. You can see the posts all the way along out here. The architect gave us the center of each of these posts all the way through. So that's how we're gonna lay out the concrete bases out here for each of those when we do concrete. And that's how we're gonna lay out all of our posts when we actually go to set these things in there. You can note that the engineer doesn't give us any sort of dimensions from the outside of building to the post or from post to post. That's on the architect. So we've got six by eight dug for number one labeled all the way through here. And then going back to that framing call out where we've got this one right here, that framing call out was to provide two CS16 straps, 48 inches long from here to here. And what you're gonna do is split that down the middle so you have 24 inch this way, 24 inch that way. To give you a better example, let's imagine this is a six by eight. And this is a six by eight here. We have a six by eight landing on a six by six post and then continuing out all the way over, they just railroad all the way through. So imagine that we have a six by eight here, a six by eight here, it's landing on this six by here. What we're gonna have is a CS16 strap that would go across the top right there and a CS16 strap that would go across the bottom here. You'd wanna make sure that they're in a little bit so you're not edge nailing up against the top that would blow it to pieces. Now in reality, these straps would be 48 inches long over over, and they're gonna tie this beam to this beam here. While you would be able to nail beam to beam, that's not a solid enough connection, so these CS16 straps, that are pretty thin, would run all the way over the course of the beam. This way, and 24 inches split that way. Those would nail in with two and a half inch Tico nails, and really tie this beam to this beam here, top and bottom. Now, while we're here, we might as well explain what that connection looks like on the top because we have a CCQ 66 to beam from the post itself. We're gonna put the hardware up on the screen so you guys can see what that looks like, but the CCQ 66 is gonna go on top of this post here and go up to the six by eight there. So that is the connection from post to beam along with the straps on the beams. Now, these are CCQ 66s all the way through here until you get to the very end out here and we have what they call an ECCQ. So what CC means is a column cap. ECC means end column cap. So it would go on the end here and run that way or that way. Let's get into our first detail and talk about that a little bit. You can see that we've got down here in the middle a number one shear wall that runs from here all the way up to that wall there. Sometimes they'll have them run out all the way through and you need to put plywood all the way out to the exterior plywood here. That's not what they're calling for in this case though. Always make sure to look at that and see if that's what they're wanting. But you can see we have a 12 foot shear wall. You can see it's a number one wall. And then you can see that we've got this detail here, three on D1. Along with that, on the same line going across, we have 1500 pound loaded truss. That right there is what we like to call a drag truss. That truss is carrying some sort of weight. And then in the same line here, you can see we have a 1500 pound loaded truss in line. What that's gonna do is be a shear connection from the shear wall that we've got here and here all the way up to the roof sheathing. So your shear will transfer from here up onto the side of the truss and all the way up the building. And I would guess that's what this 3D1 stands for here. This is what a detail looks like on a set of plans. So up here, this is the actual detail number and this is the detail page. So what we're gonna do is go to page D1 and look for detail number three. And then you can see this little line pointing over onto this wall here. Whatever this detail is here, it applies to here. You can see we have another detail over here, two on D1, and it says along entire wall all the way through here. These details or call outs, you're gonna reference in order to build this section here. So let's go to D1 and look at number three. Your details pages are always gonna be very close to your structural page. So for me, it's the very next page. 
and we're gonna look at detail number three. So now we've got that detail. That is a shear transfer. Like I said, that 1500 pound truss is gonna take the shear transfer from here all the way up to the roof sheathing. So now we can go through and look at this at exterior wall condition slash outriggers required by truss manufacturer. Along the side here, it's calling for continuous shear all the way through edge nailing not only into your plate but into the bottom cord of the truss so if that wall gets nailed off at 6 and 12 into the plate you need to make sure it's 6 and 12 into that bottom cord as well two by studs at 16 inch on center max that is typical rbc or a35 at 24 inch on center so we know that all the way through that whole entire wall we need to have 24 inch on center a35s we've got a note down here at interior wall heights greater than or equal to 10 foot provide out of plane bracing per detail two on d1 so we can go to two on D1 and look at what that out of plane bracing looks like. You guys have seen us install this quite a bit from our exterior wall here with our gable and truss coming up. We're going to have a brace stuck into this corner, nailed down, and we're going to go up. Typically we go over not one, two bays, but three bays over here. So we would actually be out here. This brace would run up, we'd fasten it into the ridge block that we'd have up at the top here. And what this is doing here is preventing this gable end along with all the trusses attached to it from being able to rock one way or another. So the way that this works in the framing world, we have our exterior wall, we have that gable end truss. We're gonna make sure that both of those are perfectly plumb all the way up because once this brace is nailed, we can't adjust it. Since this section here is directly tied to the outside here, wherever we nail it at here, this is now stuck. So we want to make sure that this is perfectly plumb or as close to it as we can get. Once we tack this, this isn't moving. Now you can see that we've got these two by braces at 48 inch on center and middle third of wall. So every 48 inches, we're going to have this exact setup. Once you get all those braces in, this roof's not moving. So that three detail runs all the way alongside this whole entire wall here. The connection that we saw with the braces that we saw will be applicable all through here. We just looked at this detail, but it's called out all along this wall from here all the way to here. And that is two on D1 and it says along entire wall. If we go back, that detail is our brace connection, just showing that brace once again. So they're asking for that 48 inch on center brace from here all the way to here. Now I want to go over something that I've made a lot of mistakes doing because I feel like it's something that other people have probably missed as well. This is one of my most common errors and I hate when it happens because it's so simple to figure out. You guys see this call out right in here double two by trimmer. This engineer made this more obvious than any engineer I've ever worked with in the past. Most of the time, they're gonna say six by eight dug fir beam and that's gonna be it. They don't show anything else. It's up to you to go to the details page and figure out where they explain this. I've messed up this exact section here more times than I can count and now it's finally stuck with me that I, I sort of have PTSD to always double check my trimmers. So we have a six by eight header. We have double two by trimmers. In the architectural episode, we talk about adding three inches for our windows. That's for our trimmers, inch and a half on both sides. But if you have double two by trimmers, so double trimmers, you go from adding three inches to adding six inches. The difference is a three inch on your header itself. So I cannot tell you how many times I've cut headers short because I don't account for double or triple or quadruple trimmers. Depending on the size of your opening, what the trimmer is doing is carrying the weight from the header down the trimmers to the sill plate. So as you get a bigger header and a bigger span, you'll have more trimmers built up. I wanna give you an example of what that looks like. So we have double two by trimmers. We have a six by eight header. We're gonna act as if this is that six by eight header. And this is a smaller one. So on a smaller opening, you would have your king stud, your king stud, your header. Your trimmers are gonna go in underneath there and support each side. And then your rough opening would be whatever you have in between here. Most windows that you're going to install that are less than five feet would only have a single trimmer on both sides. But once you get into windows that are bigger, say five foot and greater, you now need to have double trimmers to support the weight coming down. So the weight of the roof is going to transfer down through here onto the header, out over to the trimmers and down to the sill plate. A lot of construction is managing to transfer the weight of the roof all the way down to the sill plate. On a smaller opening, you'll only have a single trimmer and you would add three inches to your window. On bigger openings, you're gonna have double trimmers and it'll be called out in the details section and you would have six inches over your typical RO. So if you had, give you a better example, an 8-0 window, 
if you were to add the three inches that we normally do, that would put you at 96 plus three, a 99 inch header, right? If they called for double trimmers, you could cut your header at that. But if they called for double trimmers, this 99 would then add another three inches and you would be 102 inches. This header that you cut already would no longer work for this and you'd be short. That is by far one of the most common mistakes that I've made over the years is not double checking to see if I have double trimmers and if so, how big of a window do I need in order to have them? Now sometimes the engineer will have a little detail on one of the detail pages that shows you an opening. And in that opening, it will tell you that you need double trimmers for any opening greater than this or triple trimmers any opening greater than this. Once you get into having like a 12 foot opening for a slider, you'll have six by six on both sides. So always look carefully into that. Like I said though, this engineer is labeling the double two by trimmers pretty well, makes my job easy. A lot of what you're looking at though can look confusing until you really get into it and break down piece by piece. These lines coming all the way across here, we've got trusses at 24 inch on center. The arrow points from here all the way to here, noting that from this wall all the way to this wall is gonna be that, trusses at 24 on center. They will always tell you exactly what's gonna be there. So if this were to be trusses from here to here and floor joists from here to here, they would break it up with an arrow and then tell you that it would be TGIs and then the floor system here. So anytime you open up a set like this, it can look really confusing as there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot going on, a ton of lines going everywhere. My best advice to you is always to break it down section by section. Instead of looking at this whole entire page, break down just this corner. You can see the post here, ECCQ here, detail one, detail two, beam here, five on D1. Let's take a look at that. That points to this corner here. All the number five detail shows us is the HD in the corner of the hold down. That is a structural member that's gonna tie down into the concrete. Concrete's here. That's gonna go all the way down into the concrete. You'll have a hold down up here. And that always ties to a structural member, in this case, a double two by. But nothing crazy, nothing to note off of that detail. Let's check out a couple more details so you guys get a better understanding. A lot of this structural plans is just referencing back to that D1 page. Sometimes you'll have multiple pages. It'll be D1, D2, D3, and you'll have to reference multiples. But anytime you have a detail call out, it'll tell you exactly what page to go to. It's like building a big Lego set. So we've got this wall coming out here. You can see a six foot minimum line here and here, and then eight D1 from here to here and from here to here. So whatever's happening, it's happening on both sides. Let's look at that detail. So we had that wall coming out and over. That is this adjacent wall here. Continuous CS16 strap going onto here and then going out. The trusses that come across the top here, we're gonna install blocking underneath. Two by blocking, one size deeper than truss cord. And we are going to go that six feet out to here all the way through. So up here at the top, 24 inch strap the top plate with full nailing. Notes that we're gonna be two feet on the plate. Length of strap to blocking per plans, they showed us that six foot number going out here. So we'll strap six feet out or around three to four bays. And that's gonna go on both sides of that building line. So that's gonna go from here all the way back to there. And then from here all the way up to there. Let's look at this detail 14 on D1 to see what's going on with that wall. This looks to be a shear transfer detail two by blocking one size deeper than bottom cord of truss. So if we have a two by four bottom cord, they want a two by six block. We have an H1 clip going from the top plates up to the truss itself. We have a shaped block up to the top there. That's our perimeter nailing. They want edge nailing up against there, edge nailing down against there, shear per plan. So all they're showing us is how they want to transfer that shear from the top plates all the way up to the roof line. And that detail that we just saw is only in this little section here. So this section here is a great example of what I meant when I said that the bigger the opening, the bigger the king studs, the bigger the trimmers. As we look right here, this is the garage door opening from side to side, and we've got a single car garage over there. What they're calling for throughout this section is a four by six dug for number two full height king post. So that would be a four by six from the sill plate all the way up to the top plates a four by six dug fur trimmer with ECCQ 6.4. As we go through these videos, you can Google any of these hardware pieces and see exactly what they look like. But an ECCQ is an end column cap that would mount on the top of the four by six and then have a bucket going out, going to the header here. Same thing on the other side, four by six dug fur number two full height king post and a four by six trimmer. 
HTCQ 6 Forte header. This header that goes through is 5 and an eighth by 13 and a half glue lamb beam. This one over here is a 6 by 10 Doug fir. This one changes up a bit. We have 4 by 6 Doug fir trimmer with two LCE 4s to header. Same thing on this side. So as the opening gets bigger, so does the material that you're gonna be using. So now we've talked about the shear walls. We've talked about the call outs here, what we're looking at. Let's look at this last one just because I'm curious. 11 on D1. That's a typical Eve detail just showing us the H1 clips from the truss to the beam here. A35 is where they go up against the blocking. Not a whole lot we're gonna take from that. Just a typical detail. But in building a lot of what we're gonna be doing is looking into things and figuring out exactly what's going on there. And that's why in the beginning of projects, when you see me sitting by a plan table for the first day or two, really what I'm doing is dissecting the plan and bouncing back and forth, checking this detail, this detail, this detail here. Everything you wanna know about the building is labeled here. The roof transition from here to here, the drag truss transition from here to here, the shear transfer at truss to truss, your valley fill, your shear transfer here, everything you wanna know is gonna be labeled here. So I spend the first day or two on any project before anybody really shows up to it, making sure that I have a good understanding of what's happening because once we start going and I start laying out this wall all the way through, if I do it with two by six all the way through, I've now started off on the wrong foot. I need three by from here to here, three by from here to here. When you have six or seven guys showing up to the job site waiting for you to have stuff ready for them to frame, it can get pretty stressful and you start laying things out and you don't look too far into these details, you end up plating stuff wrong and it can go south quick. Like I was telling you, this looks the same all the way across until you realize that that shear wall detail makes these studs an inch shorter and an inch shorter and the plate go from inch and a half to two and a half. The double trimmer and the sill plate issue is one of the first things I teach any journeyman carpenters because that right there can cause a lot of problems. I've had a lot of six by eight headers cut short because of this double trimmer detail. I had one on a project recently where it got cut once by the guys and it was three inches short. We ordered a new one, it showed up and the same exact mistake happened once again. So being able to figure out the double trimmers and the sill plate is huge. The worst thing is when you build out a wall that's supposed to be a three by sill and you build it out with two by sill, you have to cut the studs an inch short and you have to somehow weasel in a three by plate. It's not a fun process. Now to close out this video, we've explained this in other plan reading videos, but I wanna go over grid lines because we didn't get a chance to do that in the architectural floor plan, but both the architectural and the structural floor plan will have grid lines. Grid lines are up here across the top and down the side. If you've ever played the game Battleship where you're trying to give coordinates to sink someone's ship on the other side, that's exactly what grid lines are gonna be. You'll have A, B, C and D across the top. And this is a fairly small house, so this one doesn't have all that many. We've had many projects that go all the way out, G, H, I. And then down the side here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. These are often key parts of the building. So you can see that A lines up perfectly with the outside of the building here. B lines up perfectly with that shear wall through the middle. And there's really nothing else that's important throughout this section. We get to C, C is that exterior that goes all the way through the building. And then to finish it off is D, and that's the exterior that way. One is that top wall and this wall here. Two is this interior shear wall that ties into the post and beam on the outside. Three is the actual exterior of the building there. Four is a structural shear wall that runs through the middle here. Number five is a shear wall here and the other number five is that exterior there. Six is just the very front of the building. Let's give you guys a real world example of how you would use grid lines in the field if you had an issue with something. Let's just say that for some reason this opening here was not working out. How would you tell somebody that this opening doesn't work? Without grid lines, it would be a guessing game of, well, the doorway going from here into there and great room into this room and it'll throw anybody off because we might not be thinking about the same thing. Not only that, the engineers and architects have many projects that they work on, so giving grid lines is the easiest way. So you would say on grid line C, which is this line all the way through here, and then in between three and four, that opening. And right off the bat, that is pinpointed to this section here. Easiest way to do it. If you had an issue, say with these right here, you would have grid line three runs all the way through, B halfway to C and that would be here to here. If you had an issue out here, that would be grid line A. Number four would bring you to right here. So you can pinpoint different locations on the building here, 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 
here and all the way across the thing in order to map out where you're having problems. If you need to, you send in what is called an RFI. An RFI is a request for information. You're gonna send this in to your architect, to your engineer, whoever you want to that had help drawing these plans. And what you're asking for, well, it's in the name. You're asking for more information. It could be there's a gray area where they really didn't draw it out too well, they didn't detail it as much, and you ask for more information there. Or sometimes we have issues where the stairs don't work out or this doesn't work out. We'll send in an RFI that gets the ball rolling. They come out and make some fixes. We've covered a lot today. We went over a handful of things today, such as the shear wall schedule up at the top, how to identify shear walls, the length on them, what number they are, and more. We talked about how the three by plating is one of the most commonly overlooked things, especially in my experience. I've overlooked that detail many, many times. And it's cost me a lot. Stay tuned for the next video. Like I said, in the pinned comment down below, you'll find a playlist link. You can click that and go watch all the videos from this series. I'm excited to read plans with you guys more and ideally elevate everybody as a carpenter. My name is Matt Pinello with Matt Bangs Wood, and I'll see you guys in the next video.